Hello, everyone, and welcome back to History of Medicine. This week in class, we're going to keep our focus on Europe and talk about a mysterious new disease that started spreading all across the continent in the 1490s. As this disease reached epidemic proportions, it stimulated new medical theories and practices and eventually contributed to the rise of modern Western medicine. What was this strange malady? And what impact did it have on European medicine during the 15th and 16th centuries? Our story begins on September 1st, 1494, when the King of France, Charles VIII, entered Italy with a massive army consisting largely of mercenaries from all across Europe. Charles encountered very little resistance in Italy. By the end of the year, he had conquered Rome, and in late February 1495, his armies entered Naples unopposed. Without much fighting to do, Charles' soldiers spent their days making merry and mischief, looting, pillaging, and having lots of sex with local women. Eventually, the bad behavior of Charles' soldiers turned local sympathies against him, and as hostility mounted against the French king, he was forced to withdraw from Italy. As he did, however, he brought with him the germs of a new and terrible disease. The first descriptions of this came from the Battle of Fornovo, fought on July 5th, 1495. A Venetian doctor named Benedetto painted a grim picture of the disease, as you can see from the excerpt on the slide here. Benedetto saw sufferers who had lost their feet, eyes, hands, or noses. Other doctors observed that the sick felt as if their bones were broken. A professor of medicine at Ferrara added that the disease began with a series of postules that appeared on the genitalia, and that it then produced repulsive rashes and sores all over the body. The First Italian War had brought people of all different nationalities into contact with one another. And when this war ended in the summer of 1495, Charles' mercenaries returned to their native countries, taking the disease with them and spreading it to populations all across Eurasia. Within a few years, the new disease had spread to France, Switzerland, the Germanic kingdoms, the Holy Roman Empire, Scandinavia, and the British Isles. Every time it entered a new country, it gained a new name, as you can see from the map on the screen. An account from Denmark notes that the contagion, which is here called French scabies, reached that land in the summer of 1495, where it killed thousands of peoples. This account also states, interestingly, that the disease, the most common name for which was the French disease, appeared, quote, because of our sins. This was not a unique interpretation. Shortly after it appeared in Austria and southern Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I issued a ruling called the Blasphemy Edict. Published in August 1495, the edict circulated widely throughout the empire and it claimed that the French disease was God's punishment for his subjects' sinful behaviors. Maximilian approved of this, stating that he thought the new disease was an expression of, quote, God's proper justice. To encourage his subjects to become more pious, Maximilian established a system of fines for anyone who succumbed to the heat of passion and lust, public drunkenness, or similar offenses. Others agreed with him that God had unleashed the French disease on Christendom so as to punish people for their increasingly irreligious behavior. The first printed medical work on the new disease was written by Joseph Grunpeck, a young scholar from Augsburg who had just graduated university. Grunpeck's pamphlet, first published in 1496, was called 
a treatise on the pustular epidemic score, or the French sickness, and it was an immediate success, being reprinted and translated into Latin and German in the years after its first publication in 1496. Part of what made this volume so popular was that it recounted Grunpeck's own personal experiences with the French disease, which he had contracted in Rome. His account is one of the most terrifying ever written on this illness. Like others, Grunpeck believed that God had sent the French disease now when the sins of the common people had become worse and worse. He wrote, Hence all those torments which lay hidden in former ages are now frightfully on the increase. Therefore it is clear that these ills are sent down by the will of God to terrify men. For such reasons this filth, which they call the French disease, clearly emanates from divine vengeance. Why did so many Europeans believe that the French disease was God's punishment for humanity's sins? Why was the dominant interpretation of this disease so religious? And how did this religious interpretation impact the way European societies responded to the French disease? We're going to take some time this week addressing these questions, and in answering them, we're going to make use of one of the foundational theories in the history of medicine, and indeed in all of social sciences and humanities research on medical topics. That theory is called social constructionism. In what follows today, we're going to learn a little bit about this theory, and in particular, how it applies to matters of medicine and health. As such, our questions for right now are as follows. One, what is social constructionism? And two, what does it mean to say that diseases are social constructs? In exploring social constructionism, I want to begin with a simple question. What makes a disease a disease? Where is the line separating the pathological from the normal? At first glance, it might appear obvious what a disease is. After all, we can all remember times when we were sick, and we have a pretty good idea, we think, of what different diseases look and feel like. We'd like to think we know a disease when we see one. But if you think about it a little bit, you might realize that diseases are not always the self-evident things they appear to be. Consider diagnoses like pre-diabetes or pre-dementia. Sometimes we can be technically diseased when we actually feel fine. If I have a high blood pressure, for example, I can be diagnosed with pre-hypertension, which means I'm at risk for heart disease. But am I really sick? What is a disease, actually? In addition to this, studies show that people's understandings of disease vary with respect to age, gender, and geographical location. Time also changes our views on disease. As an example of this, consider the disease called osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, as you probably know, is a medical condition in which a person's bones become brittle and fragile. It's caused by a deterioration of bone tissue, which itself can result from hormonal changes or deficiency of calcium or vitamin D. In 1994, the WHO officially recognized osteoporosis as a legitimate medical condition. Before this, most people just saw the phenomenon of decreased bone density as part of the normal aging process, that is, as something that just happens as people get older. So are elderly people who suffer from osteoporosis ill or just normally old? Why have we decided that something that was once viewed as normal is actually pathological? While some might say that the naming of osteoporosis as a disease simply reflected scientific advances, like, for example, better medical imaging technologies, it might also be the case that the WHO's 1994 decision reflected new expectations of health. For much of the 20th century, we expected people's health to decline as they aged. But more recently, we have a new expectation, 
the expectation that people can and should be healthy at every stage of life, including old age. So does the labeling of osteoporosis as a disease indicate nothing more than our knowledge of biological realities, or is there something cultural at work here too? Could it be that osteoporosis is also a product of social attitudes, specifically the view that old people can and should remain healthy, fully functioning members of society? How much of this comes from nature, and how much comes from culture? These are the kinds of questions that social constructionism asks. Broadly stated, social constructionism is a way of helping us understand how biology and culture interact. With regard to medicine, social constructionism helps us understand the ways we define and respond to disease. It proceeds from the idea that diseases are not an obvious feature of the world. Instead of taking diseases for granted, social constructionism teaches us that diseases are culture-bound, that is, they are shaped by social and cultural forces, our norms, our values, our ideologies, our interests, our attitudes, our biases, our fears and anxieties, our concerns, etc. Instead of being self-evident biological conditions, diseases are ideas. They are things influenced by the tastes and preoccupations of society. Without denying the biological basis of most illnesses, social constructionists point out that diseases don't exist unless people have agreed that they do. They argue that diseases cannot be understood outside the cultures in which they occur. In their writings, social constructionists often talk about how cultural biases inform scientific reasoning, and about how medicine sometimes turns differences arising from race, age, sex, class, gender, and nationality into pathologies. They argue that instead of reflecting biological realities, definitions of disease often draw on popular stereotypes about particular groups of people. That's the value of a social constructionist approach. It helps us see how immaterial forces outside the realm of biology influence our disease concepts. So you might be wondering, how does this apply to the history of medicine? If we accept the idea that even the most natural of experiences, like pain, for example, is shaped by cultural expectations, then it naturally follows that the way people talk about symptoms and diseases changes over time. We've actually already seen an example of this. You may have noticed that in the first few slides of this lecture, I refused to call the disease that spread through Europe in the 1490s syphilis. Even though that's what we'd call it today, Nobody really used that word at the time. Much more common were terms like the French disease or the Neapolitan sickness. There's a reason I prefer these. If we're going to be attuned to the cultural factors that inform people's definitions of disease and their illness experiences, we need to try to inhabit their own mental spaces. That means using their language. When we do this, we get to see all of the cultural stuff that informs what people in the past thought and what they did around illness. That's the value of social constructionism. It helps us understand why people thought the things they thought and why they acted like they did. In the coming days, we're going to have an opportunity to learn more about responses to syphilis in early modern Europe and about how social constructionism can help us get at these matters. But for our first discussion of the week, I'd like to keep things more general. Let's talk about the social construction of disease. In particular, let's think about the following. One, are all diseases social constructs? What are some particularly good examples of these? Are there limits to this theory? Two, how might social constructionism help us better understand the medical traditions of the past? 
When you've had a chance to think about these questions, please head over to our discussion forum and share your views. I look forward to reading your answers, and we'll see you all later.